Hi friends, Ian Andrews here with Lakewood Alive. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to have you uh, and it is such a phenomenal topic, especially on a beautiful day and a beautiful weekend. So we'll get started here in just a few moments. Uh, give us a chance to welcome people into the room uh, and be back with you in just a moment. Good morning, everyone. A few more folks have joined us. Uh, thanks for being here today for the latest installment of the Knowing Your Home Workshop series. Really thrilled to have you. We're going to go just another minute uh, and then we will get started. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time on a beautiful day, but boy, what a topic uh, to then go and put into action uh, this weekend. So hang on for just another moment and we'll get started here briefly. Okay, great. Let's get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Andrews. I'm the Executive Director with Lakewood Alive. Thrilled to have you join us for the latest installment of the Knowing Your Home workshop series. Uh, I'm coming to you live from my attic, so please use uh, any clutter or mess behind me, but I think we've all found ourselves in unique situations these days, so we're going to press forward. Uh, today, uh, the topic is porches and patio, making the most of your outdoor space, and boy, what a great weekend to try to make the most of your outdoor space as we celebrate spring. Uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors, the City of Lakewood, Cleveland Lumber, First Federal Lakewood, and Lakewood Public Library. We have some fantastic partners who will help us to make this uh, workshop series uh, possible. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our Housing and Internal Operations Director, Allison Urbanic. Uh, Allison put, uh, puts together this series every year and has just done a phenomenal job in coordinating our really great partners who are going to join us uh, in present, uh, presenting today. So, Allison, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, please, go right ahead. Great, Ian. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you, as well as to our presenters today for joining us. I'm sure it was tough when you woke up and saw the beautiful sunshine out there to want to come in front of your computer screens or your tele televisions. But uh, we're excited that you're here with us today. Knowing Your Home is uh, a program that's very special to me, as well as the organization. I think it's really great to bring unique topics to you. Uh, into your homes. And this is the first time we've ever done this workshop, which is titled Porches and Patios, Making the Most of Our Outdoor Spaces. I think over the past 14 months, we've all learned to use our, our outdoor spaces to the, their most uh, amazingness, allowed us to see people in times where it just wasn't safe to be indoors. And so we thought that this would be a great opportunity for us to sp spend some time and share some tips and tricks on how to uh, up door and wow, update our outdoor spaces and really spruce them up. So we're excited to be able to bring this topic to you today. And uh, so we have with us Stacy Zui Zelina with Blue Ladder Studio. And of course, Avi Selva from Cleveland Lumber. We're excited to partner with both of you today. And we're really looking forward to the presentation. So welcome. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Stacy, And if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to introduce yourself uh, and Blue Letter Studio. Sure, sure, thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, like she said, my name is Stacy Suizalina and I am an interior designer and owner at uh, Blue Letter Studio here, located here in Lakewood. And um, we focus primarily in commercial, hospitality, commercial. and high-end residential. And we're excited to talk to you today about ways to improve your outdoor spaces and um, how we can achieve, achieve some great spaces here. So let's, let's get started. Hey, Stacy, yes. real quick. We just wanna remind folks that if you'd like to ask questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A area uh, and then as we go throughout the presentation, I'll be happy to uh, track those questions and then we'll ask our experts. So uh, everyone, please, this is a great chance 
to ask the burning questions as we go along, please type those into the Q&A. Stacey, go right ahead. Okay, great. So before we um, jump into the three phases we're gonna talk about today, um, the first thing um, when updating the space is we really wanted to know what you're wanting to accomplish. Um, is it the function of the space? What are the functions? How would you like to use the space? Um, what, what is your lifestyle? Um, are you gonna be primarily using it for outdoor grilling and dining or entertaining? Or are you just looking to spruce up the aesthetics, um, curb appeal, um, that type of thing. So um, headed into level one, what can we really accomplish on a, on a one day project, uh, a one weekend um, type of scale? And that would really, you know, make a low amount of time for high impact. And a few items that um, could be done is simply by adding some planters out in your deck area or porches, planting flowers, shrubs, um, just bringing that nice natural um, texture and vibe to the space really lightens it up, especially if you're trying to add some color, flowers are great. Um, and even just refreshing some paint or stain, it can really bring life to a space for, you know, a low amount of money, a low amount of time and really make it look like a clean, fresh space. Lighting is also a huge way to enhance the space. Um, if we're just, you know, hanging some bistro lights, whether it's from the fence or from your, um, from your porch or even from some trees, uh, landscape lighting, um, updating your actual sconces or overhead lighting um, also is a great help. And um, another thing is um, doing some small gravel or paver installations. That's a quick thing you could run down to the shop and, and pick those up and um, really, really change your space um, just by updating some flooring. And lastly is furniture. So um, adding some nice pieces to your porch or your um, backyard really makes it more comfortable and helps you enjoy your space. Um, and a few tips for some of the Lakewood areas that are a little bit more tight in space is to, uh, when adding pieces, add something that can be versatile. So maybe you're going to, um, you can use a side table also as a bench or add some poofs that could be a coffee table, but you could also use it as an ottoman or also as extra seating. Um, so really that you could interchange the function of the furniture helps out when you have the small spaces. Um, and here gives you um, a little bit of an idea. You could you know, um, build a swing for your porch and it could be oversized and comfy if you have the space or at the bottom of the screen, you can see that, you know, you can do small, a small, more bench like seating. Um, so really try to accommodate and make sure you get the right scale furniture for your space. So Stacy, if I could ask a question or a couple questions, mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned planters. That's a beautiful photo. Those beautiful white um, planters that you have there really make that plant pop. If we're looking to add color, would you say the flowers should be the color or the pots or should it be a mixture? Um, I always like, that's a great question. So I always like to have the pots and the main furniture all neutral and have the accents be in the flowers or the pillows so that they can be easily exchanged, like exchanged and changed. So that, you know, if next season you want to go with a different color scheme, then that's very easy and you're not having to paint the pots or go out and buy new planters. Um, and that could go the same for the different seasons. So if you want to decorate for the seasons, that's very easy to interchange. Great. And if we could talk about lighting for a moment, uh, and this may not be uh, your expertise and totally fine. Uh, so for lighting, do you like using solar lights, um, maybe, you know, individual little solar lights or string solar lights? Do you have any experience with those and have you had any success? Yeah, I, any, any time to be more green and earth friendly is great. Solar lights are, can be good at some times, but other times it's kind of hard to get them to, to work properly. So I think it just depends on finding the right ones and, 
and making sure that they're in the proper location so they're getting the right amount of sun. And with lighting, and if we get into this further, please let me know. Um, are, I mean, lighting can be used in many ways as an accent, as I think we see here with the bistro lights. Um, what does lighting really bring to your outdoor? Like, should we be using it as accents? Should we be using it, um, you know, as like- As function. Yes, a functional lighting, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, or should we be using it more as accents or can we intermix them to really make the most? Yeah, I think definitely intermix them because there's, you know, different um, applications for both. So sometimes you're going to actually really need to see outside. And so you'll have those um, um, sconces or um, overhead lighting. And then there's other times where you just want to set the mood right. And that's when the bistro lighting, the soft white, as opposed to the bright white lights um, really help and adding lanterns and candles also are, are really nice to just set a nice relaxing mood if you're just trying to chill out and enjoy your space. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate the questions sure. and the answers. Sure. So then the next level is of project is what can I get done on maybe two to three weekends and some a little bit of larger scale projects um, to really help improve your space. And um, those would be to build a small deck, which you can see on the um, right hand side. And what I really like about this is it doesn't have to be a, a lifted deck if you don't have the space um, or um, the walkway, even if you're just coming up about like four to six inches off the ground, it really elevates the space. It helps define um, the function space where you're going to be and getting you off that ground just even helps not being so damp at night um, and just gives gives a really nice look. So th this is a small project where small enough where you could go down to the lumber yard, pick up what you need and um, and come back and and work on it for a few weekends. Um, another thing is maybe you want to build in a fire pit. Um, and that's what you see on, on the left-hand side. And that um, is something that would entail, you know, just getting going down and getting some fire brick and some decorative pavers and um, to wrap that and really creating a nice cozy feel um, and a good um, conversation area to create for, um, for gathering. Um, some other small, small projects that you could tackle are just simple porch repairs. We all know like Lakewood porches, they're always needing updating and upkeeping. Um, so just, you know, simple um, power washing and um, touch up is, is something, you know, simple and easy that really makes a difference. Um, and then some large more large plantings, instead of just planters or small shrubs, if you want to, you know, maybe order a larger tree that would have to be delivered um, and takes a little bit more time to plant, um, but that can also really make, make a difference. And it really helps to sometimes in, um, to create more privacy in, in your area as well. So Stacy, with this level two, a two to three weekend refresh, is this something that you think people can tackle on their own? Or do you think it's good for them to bring a professional in to help kind of guide them through this process? Sure. It, it just depends on your level of DIY in a, in a sense, um, what you feel comfortable with. Um, th definitely these things could be tackled on your, on your own if you have, you know, the right amount of tools and, and things to, um, to accommodate your projects. Um, but this is kind of in the middle of, it could go either way, just depending on your skill set and what you feel comfortable with. So with your work, you know, what kind of I mean, do you often work on projects like this? Uh, is it common for you to hear, you know, have people reach out to you like this? Um, when is a good time to bring in a designer? Um, I think a good time to bring in a designer is, you know, if you're, if you're struggling to see the space, struggling to understand how you want to use the space um, and, and utilize the area that you have. Um, and, and mostly, um, for, for bringing in a designer or an architect or even a contractor, it would be, you know, for, for the larger, larger projects. Um, and, 
you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, doing a patio or a deck, um, or it could be, you know, something as large as building a pergola or which, which you'll see in the next few slides. Great. And when someone might go into a contract with a person like you, is it per job? Is it on an hourly basis or is it a mixture of both? What, what kind of um, cost? I mean, we don't need to get into the actual cost, but how does it work to hire someone like you? Sure. Um, well, we work on many different um, ways and bases depending on project type. So either by hourly, um, by set fee or by a percentage of cost of the entire project. So that's something that just gets worked out um, on a project per, per project base um, and mostly depends on size and how much um, people, you know, want to, to have our help. Um, but normally I would say for something like this, for an outdoor refresh, it would be more of like an hourly, um, an hourly rate. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And here is just an example of a project um, in Lakewood that we did just showing you some before and afters um, of how really paint, first off, can really um, transform the space and, and add that curb appeal. So it just, it, it really lifts, um, lifts it and takes it to the next level. Um, in the progress photo, you're also seeing how we did some, some landscaping and rock wall in front. Um, this is on olive wood. It's a super tight street. The lots are very small, very close to the street um, and sidewalks. Um, and so utilizing space was definitely a, um, a must in, in on this project. And so you can see just how, how uh, the curb appeal has changed with, you know, doing the landscape wall, adding the planters, um, taking out a tree and, and even putting, adding pots in with your landscaping um, helps too. And um, adding some nice furnishings, touching up, you know, changing out the mailbox, updating the lighting, um, adding trim around the windows. It really gives it, pumps it up that, that extra notch to really um, help with the aesthetics. Hey, um, real quick, Stacy uh, and also possibly Allison, uh, not possibly, but Stacy and Allison. Uh, we do have a question uh, referring back to the two to three weekend project, uh, Sarah asks, does Lakewood require permits for these two to three weekend projects as an example, putting on a small deck? Uh, so I can hop, yeah. oh, go ahead if you'd no, like. go ahead. <laughs> so um, for decks, it really, you would wanna check with the building department and please don't quote me on this, but uh, I believe if the deck is being attached to the house structure and Avi, you might know too, uh, you would need a permit because it has to do with structure and if it's raised above ground uh, you would also I believe need to have a permit. If it's something like in the photo where it was just a little raised area above ground not attached to anything I do not believe you need a permit uh, because it's not structural where again if you are replacing something like major front porch work for instance um, you know structural you definitely need a permit. If you are going to build something in the back that is attached to your structure, definitely a permit uh, is required. But always check with the I building. Agree. Yeah, always. I agree. If it's something that's structural that's going to be attached to your house or something that's probably larger than just a four by four square, you probably need some type of permission to to build it. I don't think like a small platform, like if you're putting down maybe a few pallets to create like a nice raised um, deck space or just an just an accented deck space, that doesn't really need a permit. But if you're going to do something substantial, then probably yes, you, you probably should consult the building department. Very good. And you, you can always reach out to me uh, if you're not sure, um, just an email or phone call away. And I'm happy to connect you to the right people at the building department or talk through a project with you. Um, Stacy, I have one question before we move on. Sure. Do you work with any local nurseries for a lot of these um, plants and, and shrubs, uh, shrubs and trees? Yes, I work with well, Petites out of Avon. Okay. 
-hmm. And um, also, if you could talk a little bit about uh, this landscaping, for instance, um, I know when I go up to Lakewood Garden Center, there's a lot of options. Um, so it could be a little overwhelming uh, with people, uh, you know, deciding what to do. Um, so is there a nice mix? Like I see some evergreen things in here and some grasses uh, mixed in with flowers. Is there any sort of good recipe for your front landscaping? Definitely. I think just with our, our climate change um, here in, in Lakewood, it's definitely nice to have some evergreen so that your front is still looking, you know, as you can see, also I show a winter picture, um, looking a little green in the winter. Um, but I do like to, to mix in um, some perennials and annuals that give uh, some different texture and, and blossoms definitely um, in the landscape. So a good mix is always great. Uh, great, and then I see some rocks uh, in, in this picture. Mm -hmm. Do you like to mix some hardscaping in? Yeah, um, definitely. It's it's nice to, to give a little variance in there. So these rocks were actually just found when we were digging. Um, and, and so I placed them place them in the bed to, to add another element, but rocks and um, even some architectural elements, you know, there's sculptural things that you could add to the landscaping that really pop it up and make it, you know, more interesting and more unique to your personality. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then this is showing the back of this project. So it was a tiny, tiny plot, just a little backyard. Um, and you can see that it was no grass, just dirt. And um, so we did a lower deck um, and created a few different functional spaces. So a separate dining area and then a lounge area. And unfortunately, in these winter photos, you can't see, but planners were made along the two sides along the fences to really um, soften the space. That's a great, also a great way um, to, to give some more life to your space. The plants give a lot of softness instead of all of the hard materials with the wood fence and the wood deck and a concrete pad. So it it's nice to, um, to add some softness, not just with the furnishings. Um, and then this was such a tiny area um, that was left over. Um, we just added a little bit of sod um, around the deck, which unfortunately is covered a little with snow. But um, And then we gave you uh, an ex, uh, a night photo to kind of show you the glow that the bistro lights um, give that are strung from the tree to the garage that also help define the space. Hey, and Stacey, let me say, as someone who uh, loves being outside year round, regardless of the season, uh, I appreciate seeing a winter photo with outdoor <laughs> furniture uh, yeah. and hanging out uh, in wintertime. So kudos. Thank you. Thank you. And Stacy, in that situation, uh, in that smallish backyard, mm -hmm. would you have any suggestions of how to utilize the fence? Um, you know, we saw some photos with pictures of the lights kind of on the fence. Is there anything else mm -hmm. that can do to kind of jazz up their backyard uh, with their sure. fence. You could hang small planters also from the fence. Um, if you didn't want, you know, to do anything below, um, you could paint, you could stencil on the fence, um, paint it in, you know, a pattern, stain it. Um, there's, you know, some decorative things that you could even hang, just depends on, on the weather and how, you know, with the wind and everything, not, don't get too attached to it if it accidentally falls down, but um, there's definitely things that you could um, do that helps help spruce up your fence. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then the last phase, the type of project that we'll be talking about is the larger scale projects, sort of what we um, touched on before and, um, projects that probably would entail hiring a professional, hiring a pro, um, a landscape architect or designer or contractor. And um, these are for the larger scale projects that need an over, like a large overview scale um, and concept um, 
to, to fulfill that project. Um, whether you're adding a water feature or a pool or built-in um, bench seating um, or raised beds, um, a more a standalone fireplace that's going to be clouded in a in a nice brick, um, a custom pergola shown here, um, or even adding irrigation, adding a water um, a sprinkler system um, to to your lawn or your beds, um, or you know creating those large stone patios or a, a large scale deck. So those are th these are the types of projects where it's probably the best. Um, to get some, um, someone that's very experienced in this, knows, knows um, the process, like you said, with permitting, working with the building department and working with um, the suppliers to get the proper materials and, and that type of thing. This, and this last um, slide is showing, I, I do a lot of projects um, with Clunan Design Services. He's a landscape architect. And this, this is just kind of showing you um, the process of one of those large projects, what, what, what's entailed. So um, the start is um, the schematic design, working with the client to understand how they wanna use the space and creating drawings and renderings um, to communicate with the client, to let them know what it will, um, what the space will look like. And um, so you can kind of see some before, before shots, progress um, to really see what's entailed. Um, and then the, the completion project so that you can see really how well, you know, the rendering correlates with, with reality and what was actually built. Um, and and um, from, from start to finish. So like I said, this, these are for more of the large, large scale outdoor projects. So Stacy, have you had any experience uh, with smaller yards and pools? Like, is there, I like pools. Mm -hmm. I live in Lakewood, I live on a postage stamp. Um, it's probably unlikely that I could get a pool, but do they make smaller sized pools that would fit in kind of the Lakewood um, general yard size? Absolutely, they're, they're called plunge pools um, and they're becoming more and more popular. Um, they, they can be custom pools. They can also, you know, there's, there's some standard sizes and standard fit outs. Um, so you can make them to, to any, to any size. Um, and you know, the, and they're, they're used more as, like I said, just, um, a quick dip in and out. Um, but they could definitely, you know, fit on some of these smaller, smaller size plots here in Lakewood. Great. Um, so another question that I had is kind of using paint, you know, that's something that a lot of us can go out and do, whether it is we're painting our front porch uh, or our back decks. When you're thinking about picking colors, what do you take into account into making those decisions of paint colors? Sure. Um, the first is, is taking into account the items that are staying, that you're not changing. So making sure that the new colors go with that, whether it's um, a stone or a brick on your house um, or the siding. Um, so really making sure that, th that those colors go well and, and understanding if you're trying to make an accent or if you're just trying you know, for, to go with a more monochromatic look and, and just trying for, for a cleaner look. So those are the types of things I would look at. And um, do you see like the porch floor or the patio floor, deck floor being an opportunity to pop? Like, can we get real crazy with our floor colors? Is that something we should lean into or we should go crazy with our pillows instead? I would tend more to go crazy with like get a outdoor rug that you can easily exchange so that, you know, if your taste change or if you change your mind or you want, you know, to, to update something else that you're not having to then work around your new crazy accented floor. Um, so I would definitely steer more towards, you know, a more neutral um, pattern um, not saying that you can't paint a check pattern or, or something, you know, a little bit more classic, but I would definitely recommend, you know, adding that whimsy or pop of color more with area rugs, outdoor rugs, um, and, and pillows and throws. 
Great. Uh, Ian, I saw we had a question. I'm not sure uh, if it's time to insert that now. I can keep going. I have lots of questions. Yeah, okay. no, that's fine. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do it. Thank you. Um, so we were asked a question. Do you have any recommendations uh, for how to uh, lay out seating and eating areas on the same patio? Um, so how to lay out seating and eating areas in the same area? Well, it's um, like I said in Lakewood, it's nice to be able to to intermix that um, those functions. So um, you know, usually it would be nice if you could um, have some some furnishings that would intermix and be used for both. Um, and then um, if not, you can use planters as a way to kind of divide the space. Um, and, and if you want a clear cut, you know, one living area and one dining area, um, or use a different material um, for, for the flooring, um, whether, you know, your lounge area is on a deck and your um, dining area is more on a, a lower paver um, portion. Great. And I'm going to piggyback onto this a little bit. Um, so I don't know if it's just that we're all at home for the last year, but probably about midsummer last year, we had a spike in requests for outdoor kitchens, like people installing outdoor grills and outdoor cooking spaces. And I think it's just mostly because people can't really get away right now. And so they're trying to create this nice environment outside. I'd like to stress to everyone that um, try picking flame resistant materials when building a outdoor kitchen with a grill or um, a charcoal grill. Um, can't tell you how many times last year I would tell a customer, hey, I understand it's a little bit more expensive to buy fire resistant lumber, but it will save your project should something go <laughs> awry. And Unfortunately, um, last summer, we had probably at least twice a month, somebody call in and say, hey, I just ordered this from you a month ago. I need to reorder it because I got a little overzealous with steaks and half my cooking surface basically took fire because they chose to use cedar or really dry wood. And that's okay. But as far as the actual framing of the, of the, of the um, cooktop should probably be in some type of fire resistant uh, material. Unfortunately, that does happen. Thankfully, most of the time, it's just like a bucket of water that will take care of the problem. But for some customers, um, it is a it should be a consideration. We don't really think about it until we actually like set part of the structure on fire. But oh um, a lot of those flame resistant um, materials go a long way, especially for the longevity of the project. Yeah, and I think I will not going to speak for the fire department, but I'm guessing they're going to <laughs> adamantly agree with everything that Avi said. And of course, if it's a grill, you know, you don't need to get the building department involved. But if it's an outdoor kitchen, you know, make sure you check with, for permitting and everything else. And that will make sure that you're picking the right products uh, to keep everything, uh, you know, up to code and up to snuff so that we don't have to call Avi again in two weeks after we build our outdoor kitchen. And, and I like this picture that Stacy has up right now. It allows proper ventilation to the grill. I think most of us have gotten used to the wheeled, the wheeled um, grill that we kind of take around our, our backyard or our back patio. You know, we can kind of keep it close to the house, but not really. Remember that some of these modern grills, especially with propane, will get up to 700, 800 degrees. Most, most of us don't really have our grills um, set to that high temperature, but if you leave it alone, maybe you walk away or sometimes like I do, I go get a beer and forget that I have the steaks on and all of a sudden I'm running out with a water bottle trying to extinguish the, <laughs> the flame. Um, but I, I like this picture because it, it sets the grill apart. Um, it's a nice space. It uses concrete, which is a nice fire resistant material. Um, and on top of that protects the project as well because the last thing you want to happen is anything to get out of control and then all of a sudden everything else starts to go with it. So if we could just keep going with this topic line here, um, Avi, I'm going to ask you to ask answer a few questions as well as Stacy. Sure. So Stacy, concrete, this seems to be the new, the new white cabinet of the outdoor, <laughs> uh, of the outdoor area. And I mean, I love this table. 
Is this something that you would hire a, a concrete person to make? Is this something that you could do on your own? I mean, it's fabulous. It looks sturdy and to Avi's point, really weather resistant. Something this large, I wouldn't maybe t- try to tackle on your own for the first time. Um, but there are definitely uh, contractors that specifically deal with um, pouring these types of concrete countertops. Yes. Yeah, they're great. So Avi, um, if we could talk a little bit about these raised patios in our backyards, you know, maybe the pavers, uh, the wood, you know, what kind of materials can people utilize to make these types of just a little bit of raised patios, the simple little one to two day projects or two to three weekend projects, I guess. Um, what kind of materials do you have at Cleveland Lumber to do these projects? So certainly we have treated lumber that you can use to make any typical deck. You would use the same lumber for the same purpose. Um, the picture that Stacy had up, um, it looked like it, it had been stained. So certainly I would leave the material out for probably at least a month or two for it to kind of dry out a little bit so you can stain it. So that stain will take and, and keep. But certainly you can use almost anything that you'd like. Um, as a lumber yard, we, we of course receive a ton of pallets by the week. Some companies want their pallets back and some just say, hey, just feel destroy them or use them at your store. So we usually have like a stack of 20 or 30 pallets in the back of our yard. Um, and most people come by from Lakewood and they make an accent wall or will use them um, to make like kind of a, their own raised deck. It's already dry lumber anyhow. Um, we don't charge for them. We actually thank you for taking them away because otherwise we have to destroy them or do something with them. Um, but I encourage anybody that wants them, you can come by and pick them up and they're great. Um, it's great lumber there. And nowadays the way lumber is, they're made out of really good lumber. Um, and you can easily stain that, paint that, use that as a, as a raised um, deck. You may need to buy just a few extra pieces just to shore up um, because it's not as thick as regular decking, um, just to shore up uh, the, the pallets themselves for strength. But I've seen a number of projects come out of Rocky River, Lakewood, um, even, even in Cleveland, of course, mostly is um, using them as accent walls or accent pieces and then lighting being installed in between them or used as a, as a raised deck, just like a small, maybe a eight by eight little section that you can use this just, just as an accent piece in your backyard. Yeah, I was going to suggest definitely with all of the HGTV shows, I'm sure Stacy loves them as much as I do, um, that they get, you know, you can make it like a shiplap wall, you know, right. that hot word if I had a nickel every time I watched a show and they talked about shiplap. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just that could be a fun accent wall. And it's a question I'm going to ask Stacy here in just a minute once we move on, but it could also help with privacy, right? Maybe putting up just a little bit of a wall or a fence uh, that you could grow hops on or plants or something to just put a little bit of a privacy barrier up between you and your neighbor uh, as well. And that's great that we know that we can go up to Cleveland Lumber and get those uh, at f- free of charge. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I will comment on the on the cement um, table as well. So I know I had a couple customers, of course, last summer as well, say, hey, I built this nice little table in, in the back made out of cement. I made a box. I put I filled it with cement. I put it together, the cement pieces, and then they kind of fell apart. Um, I just want to remind everybody that that table probably has some type of rebar, some type of steel for structural integrity inside of it. So it's not just pouring cement into a box that you've created and then kind of jigsawing it together at, at the end with maybe some um, concrete anchors, you're going to need some type of structure inside of there. And that's where, uh, as Stacy pointed out, a professional might be utilized because they'll know what to use for that particular application. Absolutely. Great. And then would composite decking be a good option for these little small raised uh, patios? It can be. Um, I will say that Composite decking is probably more of a long-term investment project because it's so expensive in some regards compared to um, just regular lumber or treated lumber for that matter. Um, I would safely say that if you're going to use some type of composite material, it's something that's going to stay now 
for a very long time, or if not for the longevity of you owning the home. It's not something that you're going to use this year and then in two seasons say, hey, you know what? I don't like this. Let's pitch it and throw it out. It's a pretty expensive project to throw out in about two or three years, mostly because, again, composite materials are are a long-term investment instead of a short-term project investment. Great. Thank you. Um, And if we could just do a quick check-in, how are we doing with lumber and materials at Cleveland Lumber? Is this something we could just pop down there today and get and build our patio this weekend? Or, you know, what's supply chain looking like right now? So luckily we're a one store operation. So we've been able to maintain our inventory levels pretty well so far. I won't say that all of a sudden we won't get wiped out by one or two customers that come in on a Saturday because it has happened already. Usually we see that happening in August and September when our inventory levels are leveling, (laughs) no pun intended, leveling off or or dwindling for that matter. But I will say for right now that we are um, pretty well stocked right now for this time of year. Of course, who knows what that will look like in about a month or two when everyone really starts to build decks and build and and start building their additions or their um, other projects that are coming up for the warmer months. Great. Thank you. Uh, So, Stacey, if we can kind of shift gears a little bit to talking about privacy. So we know in our Lakewood homes, our neighbors, we can hand a cup of sugar out the window probably to most of our neighbors. Um, And most of us really like that. I love it. Um, I love being so close with my neighbors, but uh, I was, it was interesting. I was walking down the street the other day and I saw a house and they had pinned up a tapestry on each end of the patio or their front porch, Mm -hmm. um, obviously to put in some privacy, which was great. Um, I don't know how well those tapestries are going to hold up to the weather, but I mean, I wish those people the best. Um, Are there ways that are sturdy and weather resistant that you could create some privacy between you and your neighbors, whether it is in your backyard or on your front porch? Sure, definitely. Lots of ways um, to achieve that. Um, In in regards to the application that you just mentioned, instead of a tapestry, there can be something that's, that's, that's built. Um, more like a horizontal slat wall, um, wall or um, more like screen, not wall, um, or some type of um, lattice work that you can still see through a little bit, but gives you that privacy. Um, and shades or drapery can also be used that can be, you know, moved, um, rolled up, pushed to the side. Um, that's also a nice way to, to soften the front porch as well. Um, And then for areas in the back, like I said, planting um, shrubs and and tall grasses, that really helps um, to create that nice barrier, Um, as well as, you know, um, planters. Also, if you don't have the the yard to, um, to plant, if you have some hardscaping, you can still, you know, use the the large bushes and and trees and and put those in planters as well. Um, And then just the way you arrange your um, furnishings and your your entertaining area. um, So that line of sight isn't right, you know, right in view of your of your neighbors that can also make um, a difference. Great. And Avi, do you get a lot of requests for this type of thing of setting up some sort of privacy, any materials that stick out to you? We do. So a number of materials have come out over the last few years. Um, In particular, it was was started in Europe and in Australia, these decorative panels that um, one mill was using their wood chips or the the cutoffs of their uh, manufacturing, and then we're compressing them into these um, oil impregnated boards or sheets, and then they went CNC designs into them. And so a number of manufacturers have picked up on that um, trend, and now they make them out of PVC. So they do last a lot longer, but I don't know how environmentally friendly they are compared to the origin, the original uh, version. But that's really picked up steam in the last year um, or two, I should say. And what most people are doing is that they'll buy the panels. They're usually two foot by four foot, and they'll create a frame um sometimes it's like an eight foot by four foot frame and they'll install these panels into them and then they'll hang them either from either one side of the porch or both um there are a number of homes that i've seen around lakewood and around our store that have kind of used that same 
idea using either um, lattice, the, the typical old lattice that you see on the, uh, underneath most decks, and just to create some type of removable privacy fence, if you will. The cool thing is that you most people have utilized that framing and then they'll put hooks on to the frame so that they can easily remove them when they're done or store them for the season. That's another way of achieving that same goal. And so what kind of designs do they have on them? Oh, all sorts. I mean, um, I can't really describe them, but some of them look like, uh, like leaves. Um, others will look like, uh, like stream, like a, like a water stream. Some of them are, um, geometrical. Um, well, they'll, well, they'll use like uh, hexagons or, or pentagons and, and they're just CNC into the, into the, into the panel itself. And it's a three-dimensional um, but design, usually the way, like a relief. What's that? It's a three-dimensional. Correct. Correct. And so, um, that allows for some varying, varying, um, privacy. So some panels are sold at like a 60% privacy and others because the cuts are very, very slender or small are sold at like 90% um, privacy. So you really have to stare or get real close to it to look through it. Um, and the great thing about the PVC ones, just like the original ones, um, they're paintable. So if you don't like the color this year, you can always paint them a different color next year. And what's the rough price press, excuse me, price point on those panels? They range between like $35 and $45 a panel. Um, and again, it's PVC, so it'll last a, a, a pretty long time. The original ones that we, we also still have at the store, um, they're a little bit more expensive, but they're sustainably made. Those are probably right $100 a panel. Um, but they require a completely different install because it's actual wood, so it's probably about three or four times the weight. So just keep that in mind. That's great. And are those special orders or do you carry a certain number of them in stock? We generally keep a, a, a certain number in stock just because summer is here and we know that people are looking to do these projects and specifically because last year with people building so many decks last year, they just didn't want to use typical lattice underneath their decks. So they liked using these um, design driven panels, if you will, underneath a deck uh, or their deck for that matter. Great. Um, okay, so Stacy, how what kind of things can we use to be um, protected from the sun? So if we're in the backyard on the porch, um, or back deck, I'm sorry, are there any creative ways other than just an umbrella uh, to protect ourselves from the sun, provide a little shade? Sure. Um, you could buy canvas or some outdoor fabric to create your own, you know, canopy. And that could be, you know, in a number of different designs and, and strung from either the house to the garage or to a tree or from a pole um, or even, you know, kind of building something, um, a design, you know, whether it's off from, from the fence or from, from your deck that, you know, you bring the, the flooring up and over and it creates more more of a canopy but um that gets in you know to a little bit more more structural and, and more building um but that's also a nice way and then a, a fabric could be added to that as well great and avi it's probably not but is that something that you sell sun shader type things at cleveland lumber no not really didn't think so just thought i'd ask there's also like um, awnings and things that from specific awning companies that you could um, get custom fabricated to your space and they get attached to your house and they are motorized um, and they can retract in and out. So that's also another option. If we could talk about awnings for a moment, <clears throat> um, are they like you drive around town, you see the sun shader type ones that have the motors and they move back and forth which seem very modern and cool they have all different designs and the lights that you could hang off my neighbor has one i look at their lights and they look so fun it looks so inviting um so that's cool and very modern and then i think of other styles of awnings the metal and it just makes me think of my grandma's house um are they are they 
Is there any way to make them look like not a grandma's house style of awning or are there newer type, I mean, canvas versus aluminum? Are there other materials? Let's talk about awnings. Well, depending on the um, style of the home, uh, um, I, it, it varies, but I tend to definitely shy away of the aluminum and the metal awnings at this point. Um, and um, if, if awnings are requested by, by a client, definitely more of the, the canvas and the, and the fabric. And th there's a lot of things that you can do with that, with the, the different designs and the scalloping or the edge details um, and the scale of them. Great. Yeah, I think just for like my house faces uh, west and so I get the evening sun and I'm very inclined in my mind to think about awnings because in the summer, especially they it adds to the heat in my second floor because I live in an old liquid home. Uh, but then I think about my grandma's house and her awnings. So I haven't really put much thought into it, but uh, the canvas and the different styles and the different colors uh, and designs do make me think about it a little bit more because I feel like it would give us a lot of benefit to cool down our home, especially. Yeah, if, if that's really what you're going for, I would probably suggest more of an interior application. So a blackout drapery or shade um, interior wise that you can control so that it's not creating more of a design element to your exterior, if that is a unwanted effect. Cool, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Abby, are there any other things that you're seeing going on in our yards other than outdoor kitchens and patio style backyard design? Anything else that's really kind of hot trend right now? Pergolas. Pergolas, Pergolas are taking off um, like mad. It just, it, I, I think that people are trying to uh, create outdoor spaces where they can get some shade um, and enjoy the, the space kind of uh, all summer. And so you either have like this um, designed cover over a patio or, or especially like right outside the exit of, a, of the rear of the home. But um, that's, that's really taken off in many ways. Unfortunately, um, I wish I could say we have all the cedar in the world, but we don't. And cedar is getting more and more hard it's just getting more difficult to get a hold of right now. So we've had a, especially this week, um, I know it's been kind of a subdued week, went week and a half or so with the, with the weather and the rain. But all of a sudden, of course, when the sun broke out on Tuesday and Monday, um, we've had a flurry of people looking for cedar um, just to build some type of pergola or some type of um, outdoor structure. So that's really taken off right now in these last probably two weeks or so. Do you sell kits or is it just something that you would hire a appropriate contractor to do? Well, unfortunately we don't sell kits because about 90% of the customers that come into the store have some type of design that they're either trying to copy from Pinterest or from um, some type of TV show that they saw. Um, and so they come in with this picture on their phone and they go, here, I want this. Well, kind of hard to give you that without dimensions and without really giving, getting some direction. So unfortunately there aren't any really set kits, but I will say that like um, consulting with like a designer or um, consulting with some type of plans online might be somewhere to, somewhere to start. Generally speaking, most of our homes, especially in Lakewood, they don't really have this perfect 12 by 12 square to build from. So you have to kind of get a little creative um, so that's why I suggest probably doing your homework before coming in, making sure that this, first of all, that the structure will fit the space. Um, I had a customer in the store yesterday who bought, who already bought an aluminum one online somewhere and it is five feet too big. And so now he's got to figure out how to repackage this thing and send it back. Um, I highly suggest again, just measure twice, cut once is kind of a rule around the store, but certainly that that'll alleviate some headaches, but I wish that we had kits, but again, the, the amount of different dimensions that we see on a daily basis, just, it's just too varied. 
Great. I didn't even know that pergolas were the hot thing. That's good to know. I'm bracing myself yeah. now and I'm going to do a lot of research on pergolas because i not going to lie. I don't know a ton about them, but um, that's good to know that that is a new trend um, for it's picking up steam. I mean, yeah, it, it's summertime. So these are these, these are these summer projects that everyone's trying to tackle before the weather gets too warm or, or right now the problem is trying to find enough labor to do it and finding a contractor that's available to do it. So I think most people are in the, in the world of let me just get it ordered and get it here first and then try to find out how to build it later. <laughs> right. <now. laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Okay, so I do have a question about art in my backyard, Stacy. So like many of us, we probably have a neighbor's garage as part of our backyard or our garage. Um, are there cool products out there uh, that you could apply some sort of backyard art, obviously with permission on someone else's property, uh, but anything that we can do to bring art into our backyards, cool, uh, like a tapestry or I don't know, vinyl applique or something that would help us bring some color and art into our backyard areas. Like a screen type. Um, yeah. Something, something to brighten up our backyards. Yeah. Um, definitely. There's, you know, tapestries you could hang, but you, you do get into the, with it being, you know, fabric and in, in the, in the rain, um, there's different types of, um, acrylic screen materials that are decorative, um, a little bit more, um, flexible and, um, airy than the, the screens that Avi was talking about earlier. They're, they're more, um, like a like a metal screen, but but made out of um, a poly, a plastic material. That's something that you could hang um, and paint. Um, that you could get from various suppliers, um, and even just doing if with permission, um, doing different um, you know plant walls and maybe hanging like an herb garden or or something to help. Um, um, soften that that space um and even something um sculptural sculptural art i love using that in in the back in outdoor areas and backyard areas because that it's it helps um in the weather and sustainability and then um also bringing bringing that art into it um and definitely things that can add like a, a nice noise and ambiance, you know, whether it's like wind chimes or, you know, um, a flag, things like that, that, that give another dimension to your space. Yeah, I've been, I have a friend's birthday coming and uh, I was joking with her that I was going to get her a garden gnome. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was looking, I really wanted to get her a garden gnome, but there tended to be like three garden gnomes out there like they all look the same right so mm -hmm. i wasn't really excited with that but i did find on etsy lots of people that were doing um die cut metal into different things she and well she's i don't know if she's watching so i'm not going to say what she's getting for her birthday but uh there was a lot of different things that you could put in and then they patina uh with the weather so it really adds some sort of dimension mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. um so i was i honestly happy very surprised of all the different things that were available on Etsy. I like to use Etsy, especially if it's a small business that I can't find here in Lakewood. Um, but it was just a lot of stuff on there that I wouldn't have even thought about to add some color and design to yeah. the backboard. Etsy's a great, a great source. Very great source. So hey, Stacy, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. And, and then I've actually got uh, two other ones. So I have a, a really great huge old locust tree uh in our backyard and you know a lot of folks have trees in the backyards and you know it's, it's how do you embrace that we have a we have a raised deck we do have a pergola although i did not build it came with the house uh, the deck is slowly sinking so that's a whole nother problem uh, but nonetheless how can we potentially the tree is basically right up against the deck you know how how can you embrace your your trees you're thinking about you know maybe building a deck there's a house here in our neighborhood that they actually incorporated the tree into the middle of the deck what sort of different design ideas have you seen that really kind of you know embraces uh the foliage that can provide that shade in the backyard 
Definitely. I think you should always embrace that. Um, and it, it's great um, to incorporate that with um, when building the deck and it gives it, you know, even more that, that custom feel too, to, to, to your backyard. And I think it gives great, like not, not only the shade um, and the breeze, but um, it also gives way for you to, to hang things and to um, like, whether it's lighting, whether it's little pendants, whether it's little lanterns, um, whether it's a hammock um, gives, it can add more seating. Um, there's things, you know, you could add little shelves and you can, you can add things to it. So it, it gives you another dimension um, to your space that I think is, is very helpful and, and very cool. Thank you. And Avi, this is a question that um, I'm going to come across as a sheer amateur, but um, I don't have any pride in this department. We put in a, a board on board fence um, about a, two years ago. Uh, it'll be two years in September uh, because the other fence literally collapsed <laughs> and just rotted out. When should I stain my fence? You're muted, Avi. There you go. Typically, I would say that um, if it's a treated fence, I I would say, personally speaking, that you give it at least a couple months before you before you stain or paint anything treated. Um, especially right now with the way we're going through material, some of that material is still pretty green and wet when we get it to our yard right now. I mean, in the past, it would show up and it was already kind of drying out a little bit. But right now, it's literally as if it came out of the treatment facility 24 hours ago, some of it is still dripping wet. So I would safely say that you should probably give it at least a month or two um, before you stain anything or paint anything. And there's a number of reasons for that. Number one is that the chemical is still on the very surface of the material. So as the weather warms, the paint or stain acts like a, like a blanket, causing it to boil or to warm up even faster now or, or, or hotter for that matter, not faster, but it'll just raise the temperature, the internal temperature. And so some of that wood still has sap in it that needs to kind of evaporate a little bit or, or come to the surface. So if you stain it too quickly, um, that sap has nowhere else to go other than to boil and just penetrate to the, to the surface. So you get these bubbles through your, through your paint or through your stain. So I always, I always suggest to everybody, look, try to do your project at the beginning of the summer, let it burn through or burn off a little bit um, into July. And then after July, when, when it kind of, um, when you hopefully will get a week or two of some cooler weather, then you can paint it and stain it. Um, so I find more times than none that if somebody tries to do it bef too quickly or as soon as they install it, they end up coming back and having to restain it or sand it down and restain it all over again. Yeah, I think a good rule of thumb is to just evaluate how much sun that product gets. It needs to dry wholeheartedly. Um, unfortunately, I saw a project recently uh, that was you know, brand new treated lumber installed. And then I walked past again, like two days later, it was painted and I was like, oh no, those poor people, they're going to have to paint it again, probably next year. Um, so at least a year, I would say, like, if you're not sure, wait a little bit longer. But Ian, uh, it's time for you to stain your fence. <laughs> I believe I've waited uh, quite long enough, but thank you for reaffirming uh, what I suspected. Um, and then the last question I had. Ian, uh, oh, go ahead, Abby. And Ian, before, I mean, more than likely you'll, you'll, I always suggest giving it a quick sanding just to kind of smooth out and get get the wood prep to to accept some type of stain or paint. Of course, use a mask and protective eyewear, especially when, when working with treated material. Even though those chemicals have been um, rated to, to be um, non-toxic in some way, I still wear some type of protective um, equipment around your nose and your mouth and of course your eyes. And a, a nice little washing. Uh, if it's not painted, you could pressure wash it uh, and yeah. then it, it'll be ready for paint. That's helpful. And, and Avi, uh, while you say uh, measure twice, cut once in your shop, while we agree with that, we also say uh, always wear protective equipment pretty much all the time. So agreed and understood. Uh, and then to Stacy. Uh, one final thing, uh, as we were looking at, we, we um, had a dog, uh, unfortunately passed away, but we, we had a dog and we have two little ones here at home. 
yet other than the one fence that we had we had you know a wide open driveway and a wide open access point in between our garage and our neighbor's um, our deck and our neighbor's garage so we wanted to create the security of being able to kind of create an enclosed space without shutting out the world while we do have the board on board in the, in the rear of our property we didn't want to just kind of create a, a fortress and so we found an interesting design i saw it in a few different neighborhoods in ohio city and detroit shoreway uh, and I believe it's referred to as a hog fence. Now we are in, we too are in a postage stamp yard, so I'm not raising pigs. Um, I can barely grow grass, but nonetheless, it essentially with a wood frame and the, and the wire meshing for lack of a better term. Have you seen these kinds of things? Avi, anything you speak to or, or Allison, anything you've seen around the neighborhood? Um, I know that I've sold it. And it is kind of getting popular popularity now because I think it looks more industrial, a little bit more, and depending on the, the application. So it, it lends to itself to this modern farmhouse look in some way. And, and Stacey, you can correct me if I'm wrong because you mm -hmm. know the styles better than I do. But um, this this um, hog fence that they call, it's basically a, a checker pattern um, um, or a cross pattern. And it's made out of uh, either stainless uh, steel or some type of metal, powder coated metal. and it's a pretty nice fence. I mean, it looks a little bit more modern than, than a typical fence, but um, it is gaining popularity. It is, I think for most people, a little bit better, uh, a better application, especially with pets, because again, they can't really scratch that stuff and they can put their paws in between there. Um, the only consideration is that it does kind of become kind of a, a ladder, if you will, for, for kids. So just be careful with that. <laughs> That's my only consolation on that is it, it's a cool, it's a cool application, but then the little ones start to use it as like a climbing device. So, got it. Thank you. Uh, that's that's helpful. I and I, I like the fact that you can because it also. I mean, we're all about community and our neighbors, and so I wanted to still be able to see through and not create something that was just this you know gigantic, you know, keep away uh, kind of a a, a symbol. Um, but then, but we will have to watch that, and so uh, we'll figure out how to avoid the climbing piece. So thank you. Those are uh, all the questions that I had so far. Great. So I think we are nearing the end of our presentation. So if there are any additional questions or comments, please feel free to submit them to us. We love this, and we wish we were in person, honestly. Uh, but um, we we do want to hear from you and make it as interactive as we can. So anything, any final thoughts? Please share them. Uh, you know this this really has opened my eyes to the world that is out there, right? I think we just get so head down. We're just focused like my back patio deck needs stained real bad. Uh, but I am now energized and I'm going to start thinking about that. I, I'm lazy. I don't remember the color that is on there. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it that I need to think about. And I, I mean, I'm not lazy, but I'm lazy because I don't know the color. Uh, so I've been kind of putting my head in the sand, but we'll get there. You know, there are things that we can do that are one day projects, as Stacy mentioned, or there are big, really multiple month projects, depending on what we want to accomplish in our homes that we love so much. Um, so this is, you know, inspiring and uh, helps us to kind of start to focus. There are designers out there like Stacy that can help us make our dreams a reality. There are experts like Avi and Glenn, uh, Avi at Cleveland Lumber, of course, and Glenn at Lakewood Hardware, as well as local experts like Paul at the Garden Center that can help us really bring our reality to fruition. And the people at the Screw Factory, as Chris has pointed out, there's a lot of makers in our community that can help us, you know, add a little excitement to our backyards with their handiwork. So lots of things. Uh, and on the budget that we have, that will help us get inspired again in our in our back door, backyard areas. Um, so I think we are all caught up on questions. Uh, so thank you to Stacy and Avi for spending your Saturday morning with us. Thank you to all of you, Pam, Chris, uh, all of the other people out there. Um, it's so nice to know that we're able to connect at least in this way. Uh, again, I wish we were in person, missing all of you. Uh, but uh, thank you all. Uh, we do have uh, a workshop coming up again um, here on June 3rd. 
uh, porches, patios, making, no, that's where we are today, windows, wall, and door molding. Uh, that's coming up, and it'll be me and Matt Clark from the Toolbox, where we will help you get your window, uh, wall, and door molding back up to snuff. We're going to actually build a wall. This is exciting. We're going to install some molding. We'll show you how to create new molding using a router to give detail, as well as repairing your old molding uh, and um, refinishing it, etc. So we're very excited. That is a new workshop also for this year. And I'm excited again to work with Matt. He's great and will help uh, help us make these repairs a reality. So we're looking forward to that. And then in the middle of June, I will lead a workshop on how to contract a repair. It's very cathartic. We come together, we talk about the stresses of working with contractors, no offense to contractors, but it really is something that is a harrowing task, especially when they're all booked. So um, come and join us, we'll commiserate together. Uh, Ian and I will have a great discussion and then we'll bring in the questions from the audience. So thank you all. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, thank you for just making us part of your day. And we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Take care. Thanks.